last night on the demise of Manchester United and really in the overall personnel. Gary Breen is joining us on OTBM this morning. Good morning, sir. How are you? Good morning, guys. I'm very well, thanks. Um, Pat Nevin, I'm going to paraphrase him there and maybe put words in his mouth, but in some ways he was giving Ole Gunnar Solskjaer a little bit of a pass on what's transpired over the last few weeks when they've lost six and eight and the wheels have really come off the impact that he had made initially with that incredible run of games where they won 14 of the first 19. Um, is that fair to give Solskjaer a bit of a pass? Because you can't get away from the fact that he still was in charge mm -hmm. for what was one of the worst performances that that club has turned in in the last 25 years on Sunday afternoon. No, I don't believe you can give the Manchester United manager a pass. I think if you're a manager of an iconic club like that, you should be able to solve problems. Listen, I'm not shying away from the fact that this group of players are reverting to type. The very fact that over the last couple of seasons, they look like they're going to finish sixth again this season. So that's two sixth-place finishes in three seasons. This is Manchester United, huge investment. And I think the very fact now that they've got a cult figure in charge, they've got great tradition, that's not enough. Coupled with the money that they've invested, it's not enough. They're way behind the likes of Liverpool and Manchester City. And it has been interesting to lose six of the last eight games. I would expect if you played the eight best teams in the world, I wouldn't expect United to lose six of those games. So there's a massive problem. There's a group of players who are ultimately, and we said this, even during that brilliant run under Solskjaer, they would have to review it. That there's a lot of those players who are not of the Manchester United quality required to get them back to where they belong. And they've proved it. They've reverted to type and there's a massive rebuilding job. And you have to say whether or not he's got a body of work behind him as a manager to suggest he can fix his problem. Why do you think, from you looking on at it, Gary, it has gone so badly wrong over the last few weeks? And yes, you know, two of those defeats have been against Barcelona, one has been against Paris Saint-Germain, they've gone to Arsenal and lost, but at the same time they've lost twice to Wolves and they've lost to Everton as well. So you can't really write them off. What has happened the effort that has been put in by the players is something that Gary Neville questioned in stark terms at the weekend. And that was one of the things that we saw a huge upturn in, the pressing game, the intensity that they brought to their games. As soon as Solskjaer got the job, they were like a different team. Why have they reverted to type? Whatever about the quality, whatever about the issues of the personnel at the back, you probably wouldn't pick any of that back for for a top six side. But the, it's the effort and the application that has reverted to type. How and why has that happened under Solskjaer? Because ultimately, this is what these players are about. They lack consistency. And when I always think about Manchester United players, there's there's been great players before who haven't excelled at United, haven't been able to cope because you have to play week in, week out. You're the biggest show in town when you come along. You're the team everyone wants to be. There's this drive that you come from the other players that you have to perform, not only on the Saturday, but you hear the quotes now, people saying, you know, the stories of Manchester United saying that you're a Manchester United player 24 hours a day. And these players just can't cope with it. It's as simple as that. On their day, yeah, there's some fantastic players in that squad, but it's a lack of consistency. That's the big golf that they cannot do it week in, week out. And you say, why has it suddenly happened? It was inevitable it was going to happen because this is the character of these players. And now everyone will say, listen, you can't question their ability. No, at times I can't. They are, they are, they are fantastically gifted technical players. But there's no doubt I can question their work ethic, their, their attitude, their desire to just be footballers and nothing else. Before we focus specifically on the game tonight, there was a couple of interesting statements from Solskjaer in the build-up to this Derby game where he admitted that he feels United are unlikely to contend for the title next season. He, he said, let's see, never say never, but no, we're so long his away tone from it. now, isn't he? Well, that's he's changed that's, his tone. Yeah, the, what's the question? Like, it's hardly a profound statement. We can all see that United yeah. are miles away from being a title contender next season. And you can see how far off the top two they are at the moment. But all the same, Gary, it's a far cry from the statements he was making six weeks yeah. ago. We are Manchester United. We're expected to win games. We're expected to come from behind late on and steal three points. We are expected to win Premier Leagues. This is what this club is all about. When he got the job originally... And now he's telling Manchester United fans, you yeah. know, don't be going into next season with any expectations. This is a long-term job. It's a very different Solskjaer now in terms of what he's saying to the supporters when he was making all the right noise, noises just six weeks ago. It's very much like, uh, you know, a party before an election, you know, and then they get voted yeah. in. It's like, nah, well, you know, we did promise that, but, you know, let's be <laughs> yeah. honest, we don't have it. <laughs> Listen, it's, it's exactly that. And you say about he's changing in terms of his tone. Visibly, he's changing. 
he looks withered already in terms of that um, that bounce that he had. And I know, listen, by winning games, that changes things. But you're right, and I, I'm glad you've identified it. And I'm sure that an educated Manchester United group of fans will do. They know they've got their their fans' favourite in charge, but suddenly they'll be starting to ask questions. Hold on a minute. You you said about Manchester United, we'll get back to this. Now, all of a sudden, no, it's going to be a lot longer than I thought. That would be concerning. And I think it shows you how quickly things change in football. About a month ago, everyone's saying that Solskjaer's a man, Pochettino's, um, seeing Tottenham's title chance collapse with just one point from 15. Fast forward to now, Pochettino's got a team with no investment to the Champions League semi-finals, a very good chance of beating a, an Ajax team over two legs. And Solskjaer's lost six out of eight games. Just shows you things change very quickly. There, there's an element of him playing politics as well, isn't there, Gary, in the sense of how yeah. well he managed sort of the media and the fans in that honeymoon period when he hadn't gotten the job and now you see that sea change when uh, he knows that he has the time or certainly has the um, the contract to say well let's let's uh, let's dampen expectations here and kind of change the narrative the one uh, you're right there and, and one of the other things that i was was noticeable certainly in that defeat to everton was the fact that they didn't get off the bench he was not demonstrative at all he just sat there and just let it unfold now i'm, I'm certainly one of those coaches, players who, who expect the players to take care of business when they cross that line. But nevertheless, you want a manager cajoling, demanding. There's no way Ferguson would have sat down there. And he keeps referencing Alex Ferguson wouldn't accept it. And I'm just thinking, come on, man, just have your own identity a bit. I know like, you, I know, in terms of he's your mentor and stuff like that, but just stop banging that drum because you've got the job on the back of it to a certain extent. And some brilliant results, listen, take nothing away from it. He, he, he's galvanised that whole club in that period. But this is the real test now, going from a, um, a temporary manager to a permanent one. And I just, I'm, I'm just looking at situations thinking, this don't look like it's going to go the way they hoped. I was at Ultra or at Goodison Park for off the ball on that that day. Everton beat Manchester United. I think it was three nil under David Moyes. It was the day the Grim Reaper was standing in full costume behind David Moyes at Goodison Park. And I won't lie to you, Gary. Last Sunday felt very similar. The way that they were completely outplayed, um, both in terms of the application, but the actual skill as well, and the beleaguered manager on the sideline. And that was at the end of a long, tough season for David Moyes, where nothing seemed to go right for him. Sonder Gunnar Solskjaer is only in this job 12, 13, what, 16 weeks now at this stage. It's, um, you do fear for him if he can't get it turned around quickly. And from a Manchester United fan point of view, I'm sure some of them would say that the honeymoon period at the beginning of next season has now been dramatically shortened. Would you agree with that? That if they don't finish top four, having almost miraculously found themselves in a position to contend for that, suddenly Solskjaer will find a couple of bad results at the beginning of next season and maybe his legendary status at the club won't be enough to keep the fans from howling for his name to be maybe thrown out of the club. Oh, no, listen, he has to win games as Manchester United manager. Everyone does, regardless of whether or not you're a fan's favourite. But you're right, I, I think you're, you're at your spot on there. I think how they finish this season has a massive effect on how well the start of next season goes. And I, and I, I would agree with you. I think you're getting a lot of people now who are criticising him, saying, well, listen, he's playing a defensive style of football that's not that different to Mourinho. He'll play defensive tonight, and I can understand that tactic. Certainly, they'll look to suck City onto them. And the very fact that City are vulnerable to quick counter-attacks and United have that pace in those advanced areas to hurt them. But even Van Gaal is saying now that he's playing Mourinho-tile football. They're all having a little bit. There's no doubt Jose Mourinho is looking at this situation for Solskjaer and saying, listen, I told you about these players. This is what I've had to put up with, that you, you just can't rely on them. So it's a massive end of the season for Solskjaer. I think he'll want to finish on a positive. If he can get in that Champions League, that would be incredible in terms of the rebuild job they need to entice the top players back into United with Champions League football. But I think it's a huge game tonight. You see a kind of a mass purge of some of those players in the off-season, Gary? Yeah, without a doubt. And and not not just because Solskjaer are coming in and these results. You have to ultimately say, and it, and it doesn't take anyone to have to work with them day in, day out to know that they're not good enough to get Manchester United back to where they belong. That's challenging for the title. Pat Nevins always gives you really a good, honest appraisal of things. And the very fact that he said, how many of those players would you want? How many of those players would the top teams, Liverpool and City, want? There wouldn't be many of them. Well, the, one maybe, maybe two. Like they did give Phil Jones a new four-year contract. You wonder what the thinking is behind that, for example. I'm not just singling out Phil Jones, but it's mm. it's an indication of the overall mindset of the hierarchy at Old Trafford. Several high-profile managers now have come and gone, and they've been unable to halt this slide since Ferguson left. 
Yes, they haven't been doing the best of jobs, Van Gaal and Mourinho in particular, but at the same time, the way the club is being run, you wonder when or if heads would roll as regards how the uh, transfer policy has been put in place. They don't seem to be delivering in the academy anymore either. It's a, it's a club that is in dire need of a complete refit, but on the pitch and off it as well. An interesting one for you, Gary. We put a poll up on Twitter, as we love to do around these parts, and it was two Manchester United fans. Would you rather one of the three scenarios tonight, arising out of tonight's game, lose and Liverpool's Premier League title aspirations pretty much gone because you would expect City to get the job yeah. done after that, win and pretty much hand the title to Liverpool or draw, barely keep the top four alive but you've scuppered City's chances of winning the title and you've pretty much scuppered your top four chances as well and the results, I don't know if they're surprising but they're definitely interesting, 33% Exactly a third of Manchester United fans would rather see United lose tonight yeah. and Liverpool be out of the title race. In, in you could say, you know, it's, anything can happen, but almost certainly out of the title race. Forty-six percent want to see Manchester United win and hand Liverpool the title, but still be in a great position to finish in the top four. And twenty-one percent a draw, keep the top four alive. But at the same time, you're pretty much giving Liverpool the title. What are your thoughts on that, Gary? You're probably not surprised. It also should be it should be shown here that you don't have to be a Manchester United fan to vote, and I think a lot of Liverpool fans have yeah, definitely voted yes. in this. Yeah, Hijacked yeah. the poll <laughs> because it's way more than 33 percent. It's like it was it was a line that I read yesterday in the papers. Like 95 percent of Liverpool or Man United fans would admit to you that they want they don't want Liverpool to win the title, and the other five percent are lying basically. And that's you know that's what this <laughs> is. Like. So. What do you think, well, Gary? Listen, I, I, I would have, that is exactly what I would have backed. That United do not want Liverpool to win this title. They're so precious in terms of the amount of Premier League titles. They obviously at each other all the time over that. They're at each other in terms of European Cup wins. But I, 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 it's just a horrible scenario for United every way they look, isn't it? It's, a, it's such a dilemma. And I don't know. I look at the scenario now. I, I, I know that United can produce a performance out of nothing in terms of that. I know that City are vulnerable defensively in terms of those quick turnovers. Tottenham proved that. Proved it again at the weekend and numerous chances. The likes of John Stones wouldn't trust to keep them out. They don't read situations quick enough. But I just don't know. I, I, you still think, even without De Bruyne, that City will have too much for United tonight. Yeah, you would think United are going to need 15 points if they're going to be finishing in the top four from the five games that, that they have Well, listen, this is the problem. I, I thought it was a nap that they were going to get in the top four. Bearing in mind that Arsenal and Chelsea were having their struggles in terms of the, the inconsistencies. Yeah, like the position for them they've got to themselves to, in. Yeah, to, for them to have thrown it away literally now, Solskjaer, I know the very fact that Arsenal lose at home to Palace, but you still expect them to to probably nick that last four spot, mm. bearing in mind the games have got less. Having said that, they're going to Leicester away from home. They're shocking away from home. Leicester have the type of pace that can hurt Arsenal's defence, but Tottenham have nailed on for that third position. That was a massive win against Brighton last night. Yeah, you think those defeats at Wolves and Everton. I mean, they, they picked up two points on the six on offer in those games. They've been yeah. a, in a really good position to finish top four, given that they've Chelsea this afternoon, and that game is live and off the ball this Sunday afternoon. A couple of other quick things, Gary, before we leave you. You've mentioned that win last night for Tottenham. Big goal, great goal from Christian Eriksen, who's hitting his top form just at the right time, ahead of that two-legged tie with Ajax in the Champions League semi-finals. The point would have been brilliant for Brighton. Do you still see them as favourites to beat Cardiff to that uh, 17th position? Or are they just showing a real inability to dig out results at the moment? And if Cardiff can get one more, and they have a couple of very winnable games, most notably home to Crystal Palace, that Brighton come that final day against Man City, they might need something from that game. Yeah, there's no doubt it's a huge point against Wolves. You say about the game against Palace, Palace are so good away from home at the moment. They've got more, more results away from home than they have at home. But... It's a massive game, Newcastle at home on Saturday. They can put everything to bed now for Brighton. But the problem that they have is that's seven games now without a goal. They're no goal threat. And it's all well and good playing that defensive style and something we've seen with Ireland, defending on the edge of your box, making it difficult, making Duffy and Dunk look great players. But you need to be a goal threat and they haven't been. So I, I think they will survive Brighton, but I think it'll be a case of the season running out um, too quick for Cardiff, who've, who've actually done a great show in terms of their first season back in the Premier League. But everyone's talking about Brighton. There's a little bit of criticism I can, and you can sense it as well with these new guys that they've brought in that they've, they're trying to convince, we've heard murmurings out of change room, they're trying to convince Chris Hutton to play a more expansive, more attack-minded game. They can't. They play that way, they'd be ripped to pieces. There's no doubt about that. It suits them playing defensively the way they are, but they've just got to be more of a goal threat somehow. Yeah, I think they're, they're three points clear. They have a vastly superior goal difference to Cardiff yeah. City. So Brian will have to 
uh, drop points in two games. Cardiff need to make up four points against them, uh, up against Brighton, really. Brighton, ha- Brighton have to get something against Newcastle because I yeah. want back them to get anything against Arsenal sitting their last two games. A point there, I think, and Brighton should be OK. But you say it's a case of maybe Cardiff running out of games than Brighton doing yeah. anything that really sees them deserve to actually stay in the Premier League. Um, before you go, the prayer, Player of the Season nominations came out a couple of days ago. We, first time we've had a chance to talk to you about it since. Um, City obviously dominating the six-man shortlist for the, the PFA Player of the Year. Van Dijk, uh, Raheem Sterling, the two front runners. Sadio Mane is also on the list. Uh, Sergio Aguero, Bernardo Silva as well, and Aidan Hazard. Who would you have? Well, listen, uh, the difficulty about this, and of course the timing of it as well, is that ultimately you, you want to make a decision based on who wins the league. I know I don't want to go down the likes of like the MVP in, in um, American football as such, but this is the one occasion that you'd be reluctant to it to, to announce it. If you're saying to me right now, I would still go with Van Dijk. I think the influence he's had on Liverpool is incredible, the amount of clean sheets. I think they've had 18 as a team. I think he's been in the team for 17 of them. He's elevated that Liverpool team. But then I'd counter that by saying Raheem Sterling has just been gone to a completely different level in terms of his goals, assists. I think the only way you probably look at it, for me, I would probably give it to Van Dijk, player of the year. Sterling, still young player of the year. But then with honourable mentions to the likes of Sadio Mane at Liverpool in terms of picking up the, the mantle in terms of when um, Salah was struggling for goals. Also, Bernardo Silva, what he's done at City as well in terms of driving them forward, covering the the, the, the loss of De Bruyne. The very fact that Mahrez has come in for a big money signing. He's been able to bat him away. And then other young players you have to give a mention to would obviously be Deccan Rice at West Ham. No, Bro- no, 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 no. <laughs> take, take. No, no, We've got to take that away. We've got to be professional, Johnny. Ooh. We're talking about performances. <laughs> <laughs> oh God! Yeah. It's it's an interesting one. The young pair. Where's of the that year, but... jar for me to throw some money? At? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if Sterling and Silva, if Van Dijk wins the Player of the Year award, Sterling or Silva obviously must win the Young Player of the Year award. Yeah, Trent Alexander Alexander Arnold is in there. Uh, Brooks at Bournemouth is a brilliant season. Is there Declan Rice? Yeah. But. Um, Marcus Rashford also, and I really couldn't see him win it, but uh, it's an interesting one. It's um, do you, is it something that should be left until the end of the season, Gary? Because you you did yeah, like it to one. the Super Bowl situation, and yeah. you know so much goes as to who wins the Vince Lombardi Trophy at the end of that game, as to who's mm-hmm. going to be winning the MVP. I would agree with you that if you lead your side to the title, which is going to be the case for either Raheem Sterling or Virgil Van Dijk, you win it then. Yeah, listen, in this instant for these two particular teams, now I've seen other. Um, teams win the title and, and I've still identified that someone had a better pl- a player of the year team um, performance over the season elsewhere but in this instance it seems so apt that we would have to wait in terms to see who was the definitive winner as such in terms of the teams and I, I think it's a difficult one the only problem is is that when you're a player you get these ballots sent out to you around February time so you've got to make a decision February beginning of March there's still so much of the season to play the business end of the season when it matters most so more often than not, these, these, the timings of these is based on when the, the vote is actually done. OK, one more question. Shane Long scored last night. It's yeah. his third in four games. I think it's as good a run of form goal-scoring-wise as Shane Long has been. Certainly going back to his Reading days and maybe going back to his very first days in the Premier League. Um, Jeff Hendrick, brilliant volley against Chelsea Monday night. Yeah, We've seen the Sheffield United boys go brilliant in front of goal. Connor yeah. Harron's yeah. thrown in a couple of absolute pearls in this incredible run that Aston Villa have been on. I don't know if you heard Johnny waxing lyrical about the atmosphere, the quality of the football at the Tallis Stadium last night. We've had two UCD starlets earning trials at Manchester City. New management team in place, two wins from two in the Euro 2020 qualifiers. Irish football, Gary, has never been in better health than it is right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, certainly not over the last two years, it hasn't been, no, but... Long may it continue. What about Shane Long? I mean, this is perfect timing for our point of view going into those June games. Uh, he's been missing both with injury and when he has been yeah. playing, he's really just struggled to score goals for us. We wonder where the goals are coming from. It would leave you feeling very optimistic given the form of the likes of McGoldrick, Shane Long, Conor yeah, Harris, the return to form to Seamus Coleman as well, going into these matches and then into the autumn when Mick McCarthy's fate as Ireland manager in this campaign will be decided. Well, listen, it's great in terms of Shane Long. He's, he's had a, a tough time as such and it was a typical goal of his last night in terms of his work, his endeavour to close it down and then what a brilliant finish as well. He talked about Ben Foster having been with him at West Brom, how good he is at spreading himself. But that little dink finish was brilliant. So his confidence will be high. There's no doubt Hassan Hootel going into Southampton has had a big bearing on him and a lot of other Southampton players. But yeah, you're right. There's a lot of confidence going into it, into the summer. And, you know, it should. I'll look forward to those games now. They're always difficult games because there's a big lull. 
normally three or four weeks between playing. It looks like those Sheffield United guys now will get automatic promotion as opposed to going through the playoffs. So it does bode well, and, and um, I'm, I'm great, I'm delighted to see it. Call that game tonight. Give us a result. Um, 2-1 City. And then City to win the league. Um, yeah, I, I, I know everyone's saying win this game, but I think Burn <coughs> excuse me, Burnley is a tough game. I think it's a tough game from it will test them, but... I think if they can get past United tonight, then I think it's it's there for them, no doubt. Okay, Gary, brilliant as always. Thanks a million. Thanks, guys. Have a good day. See you, Gary.